Uh, welcome everyone to this special event, which is jointly sp sponsored by Radboud Reflex and the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics. Uh, my name is Simon Fisher and I'm one of the directors of the Max Planck Institute and it's my great pleasure and honour to introduce our distinguished guest speaker this evening. Dr Susan Blackmore is a psychologist, lecturer, writer and broadcaster renowned for her work on consciousness, memes and anomalous experiences. Dr Blackmore is visiting professor at the University of Plym Plymouth and she writes for several newspapers and magazines, including New Scientist, Scientific American, and blogging for the Guardian newspaper and Psychology Today. And she's a frequent contributor and presenter on radio and TV. She's authored more than 60 academic articles and around 50 book contributions, as well as a textbook, Consciousness and Introduction, now in its third edition. Her influential 1999 book, The Meme Machine, has been translated into 16 different languages. And other notable books include Conversations on Consciousness from 2005, in which she delves into the mysteries of human experience in discussion with 21 leading philosophers and neuroscientists, including Dan Dennett, Francis Crick, Ramachandran, and others. Her latest book from last year is Seeing Myself, The New Science of Out-of-Body Experiences, now, that title gives some clues to the unusual trajectory that has led Dr. Blackmore to become a leading figure in discussing the science and philosophy of the human condition. During her first year studying psychology at Oxford, she had an incredibly vivid out-of-body experience lasting over two and a half hours, possibly triggered by a mixture of sleep deprivation and cannabis. This was such a dramatic experience that she says she became convinced of telepathy and clairvoyance, precognition and psychokinesis, souls and spirits, and decided to devote her life to proving all this to those closed-minded scientists out there. This was in the 1970s and 80s, before there was much in the way of neuroscience to explain subjective experiences of the human mind. She became a parapsychologist, but as she looked deeply into this area, the experimental results led nowhere. She uncovered no evidence of paranormal phenomena whatsoever. In the early 90s, the origins and bases of consciousness began to be discussed seriously among psychologists, gaining a firm foundation with the growth of neuroscience, and Dr. Blackmore started finding answers in terms of explanations offered by natural science. So this early transformative, almost spiritual, out-of-body experience became a jumping-off point for sceptical scientific investigations of big issues concerning consciousness, and that led her to her work on memes and evolution, and as we will hear about today, the future of artificial intelligence. Now, before we begin, uh, I'd like to tell you more about the structure for this evening. First, Dr. Blackmore will give her talk, which will last about 45 minutes. Then we're joined by our expert discussant, Dr. Pim Hasselacher, Associate Professor at the Donders Institute here at Radboud University. He's a Dutch philosopher researcher in the area of cognitive science and a strong advocate of an embodied, embedded perspective on cognition and intelligent behaviour, with a special interest in integrating empirical work with philosophical issues. And after about 25 minutes of discussion between Dr. Blackmore and Dr. Hasselacher, there will be the chance for you all, well, some of you, to ask your own questions. <laughs> So, uh, welcome to you all again, and without further ado, I leave you in the very capable hands of our guest speaker, Susan Blackmore, with her talk, Genes, Memes and Dreams, The Future of Artificial Intelligence. Wow, that makes me sound really amazing. Thank you very much. Although I'm not sure I can quite live up to that description but it was certainly very true of the strange life that I've had and the weird ideas I end up uh, promoting or throwing out for you, for your consideration. <sighs> I want you to answer these questions <clears throat> in your own head. Where did all this stuff come from? Why is it here? Uh, who, who designed it? Or what designed it? What about all this stuff, all this cultural stuff? Why is this here? How was it designed? Who did it? Why? What about this stuff? And more, I can't give a picture of all the information flying about between these machines, but how did that get here? And why? And who designed it? My guess is that at least some of you will have three different answers to those questions. But I want to give one answer 
to those three questions. And that depends upon the best idea that anybody ever had. Yeah, I can tell from your laughing that you think it's a wonderful idea that anybody could have the best idea that anybody ever had. But if somebody did have the best idea that anybody ever had, who do you think it was? Well, correct, Darwin. I mean, there's no truthful answer to this, of course, um, but other people have said this and I quite agree. So what I'm going to be talking about is universal Darwinism. This is the idea of applying Darwinian's insights into evolution by natural selection to everything. In fact, I would go so far as to make the claim that all design in the universe is uh, due to the operation of the evolutionary algorithm. I was at um, Dutch Design Week, can it be yesterday? I think so. <laughs> and that's very much, I realised, they said, oh, you know, can you make your lecture a bit relevant to design? And I was thinking, oh, that'll be difficult. And then I realised, actually, uh, not difficult at all, because I think that, that about design. So the term universal Darwinism came from this very famous book, the 1976, The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. How many of you have read The Selfish Gene? Excellent. Uh, well, no, pro not that excellent, actually. Probably in about a fifth of you. What's wrong with the rest of you? Um, <laughs> you really should have read this book. I know it was published in 1976. Oh, I meant to look it up today, but I forgot. Um, but when I looked up a couple of weeks ago, it was at, uh, in the thousands on Amazon. Are any of you here authors? There must be some authors here. Yes, one. Uh, do you look yourself up every so often on Amazon and see where your books are? Never. Never. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm too low as well. You know, I've got lots of books and, and they're, you know, they're way, way down in the hundreds of thousands usually. Um, and this 40-something-year-old book is up there for very good reason. Of course, the biology is very much out of date, but the gist is not. Anyway, the point about universal Darwinism is to say that... What Darwin was doing in his 1859 book on the origin of species, and how many of you have read that? Yes, no, that is, that is impressive because it's a tough read. I'm not telling anyone to go and read it because it's really hard, but to know about it is, it, it is all right. And I'm just going to give you the short version. Okay, so the short version of On the Origin of Species, in my opinion, goes like this. It's a three-step algorithm, although Darwin would not have had the concept of an algorithm. But basically, he says something like this. One, if creatures vary, and this cannot be denied because I've been to the Galapagos and I've measured all the, finch, the finches, the beaks of the finches, and I've counted the number, you know, blah, 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 and a hundred pages later. And if there is a struggle for life such that most of those creatures die, and this can't be doubted because I've read Malthus and I've counted how many tadpoles are created by one frog and I've worked out how long it would take the entire planet to get covered in elephants if none of them died, and a hundred pages later. <laughs> and if the very few survivors pass on to the next generation whatever it was that helped them survive, then that generation must be better adapted, better fitted to the environment in which that happened than the parents were. Design. As Dan Dennett, who was here last week, I believe, as he puts it, you must get evolution or design out of chaos without the aid of mind. Without the aid of mind. Now, this is not just the mind of God, which, of course, was what terrified Darwin at the time, because I think... I've had a wonderful experience with American evangelists and such like, just occasionally. Um, I was once in a queue um, get, to get into the States, which you can know can take ages standing in the queue, and I got chatting to this man in front of me who was an evangelical preacher, and I explained this to him, and I had this, for me, wonderful experience of seeing him going, uh, you know, you could just see he got it. Once you get it, you don't need a designer God. And I'm going to go further and say you don't need creative minds in the sense that we normally think about them. But before I go on, what do you think is the, my favourite word on this slide? Chaos, Chaos? no. Pardon? Selection. No, not selection. Pardon? Must. Yes. I've even put it in capitals to give you a clue. <laughs> You're not very observant, are you? That was a test. Um, 
the reason, it, my reasoning is that's what's so amazing and what part of what makes it the best idea anybody ever had. When you see it, you see it's inevitable. It's a kind of the mechanical process. It has to, it has to give rise to the next generation being better designed than the previous one. It has to happen and therefore all this stuff happens on Earth. So there we have the, the, the basic idea. But I want to go back to the selfish gene. Because in explaining about universal Darwinism, what, what Richard wanted to do was not just explain about genes, which he did, you know, beautifully, or in his own selfish gene view that not everyone agrees with, but became more or less mainstream ever since, um, but was to make the point that this is a general process that doesn't, needn't just apply to genes. Genes are just one example of a replicator. That is, a replicator is information copied with variation and selection. So, in the last chapter of the book, he asked his now famous question, are there any other replicators on this planet? And you can imagine his answer was <laughs> correct. He said, look around you. Swimming about in the primeval soup of culture is another replicator. Songs, stories, ideas, ways of doing things, anything that we pass from person to person. Because we humans are capable of imitation, and therefore we keep passing information on from one to the other, and um, this undergoes the evolutionary algorithm. And he said, I need a name for the new replicator. I hope my classicist friends will forgive me if I take the Greek word mimeme, which means that which is imitated, and abbreviate it to meme, so it sounds a bit like gene. So, genes, memes. And that is how the term meme arose. So, the fundamental definition of a meme is that which is imitated. Now, of course, the word has got loose in the memosphere, but if you ever have a question in your own mind, is something a meme or not? Just ask yourself, was it copied from somebody else? So examples are songs, stories, games, monies, ways of dancing, um, driving on the left in England and driving on the right in the Netherlands, um, riding bicycles, um, scientific theories, uh, all of these kinds of things. Um, and of course, internet memes. Now, I am not... Uh, very clued up on recent internet memes, um, but there are more and more of them all the time. This is one of my favourites. <laughs> Does everyone remember this? Or is it new to you? Both. Okay, ceiling cat. I just, I love ceiling. I used to fall about the floor with my grandson because we'd both go kind of, oh, it's gone. <laughs> and, oh, look, 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 you see it? No. It's closed up again. The hole is closed up. So Ceiling Cat is watching you masturbate. Who does this or what does this remind you of? Well, it wasn't long before there were lots of other kinds of holes in the ceiling, lots of other kinds of cats. But more interestingly, I mean, the point is people are putting in the variation. Variation comes from all the people out there who've got uh, computers and phones and whatever and, and cameras and taking pictures and stuffing their poor cat's heads through the hole. But it quickly got the idea that, well, maybe there should be a basement cat. <laughs> so God's watching you masturbate, and the devil is luring you into the wicked deeds. And the final battle, who's going to win? Well, we know what happened in the early years. <gasps> Poor God, killed off by basement cat. So... I could show you hundreds of these things, but probably tens of thousands, or I don't know how many, would have been created, and most of them failed. At the time when this was popular, I photographed my own cat standing amongst my cannabis plants uh, and made some little joke thing and, you know, has cheeseburger sort of thing and tried to make a viral meme and nobody paid any attention at all. And, you know, uh, it's not easy to catch the, the, the mood. This is how selection works. Stuff gets thrown out into the world and... Uh, most of it fails, and the bits that succeed can be copied again and passed on and altered again. So, this is just by way of illustration of the idea that memes are replicators, that is, information copied with variation and selection, but in this case, between human beings, or between humans and books and whatever. And they are selfish replicators. Replicators simply are selfish. This is often misunderstood in the selfish gene idea. 
it's the genes that are selfish, not the products they give rise to. And uh, Richard was absolutely determined in the book um, to show why and how selfish genes give rise to altruistic people and groups of animals and, and so on, um, and maternal loving behaviour and all kinds of other things of that kind. But the point about the selfishness is a gene is just information um, stored on a, in the order of bases on a molecule. It's not just that, but that's one way we can think about it. It's just information. Of course, it can't be selfish. You can't be sitting there inside your cells going, ooh, I want to do this. It's selfish in the sense that it will get copied whenever and however it can without regard for the consequences. Those consequences being to us, to its carriers, it matters to its carriers that it passes it on, but it doesn't matter to whether we're happy or not, and it certainly doesn't matter to the planet or anything else. So memes will be selfish in the same way. Cat pictures are selfish in the sense that they will get copied whenever they can without regard for the consequences. And who's going to do the copying? Well, us, of course. So I like to think of it this way. Imagine a world full of brains. Oh, look, here's a world full of brains. Really brilliant brains here, I can see. And imagine there's all these brains, but there are far too many memes to find homes. And what's going to happen? Just think about your day-to-day, -day, if you would, for a moment. Just remember the first memes you saw or heard when you got up this morning. There have been quite a lot of them, haven't there? You may have read the news and got depressed and turned on the radio or looked at your email or any number of things or started talking to somebody. It's been memes all day, I would suggest, unless you've gone off and had a run or got away from it somehow. Even then you might have had your headphones on. And here am I bombarding you with more memes. And what's going to happen with the memes I'm throwing at you? Well, probably you'll remember some of them, but not very many. You wouldn't be able to give the lecture afterwards. And of the few that you remember you probably won't pass on very many. I hope you'll go home and tell everybody about it. Oh, this amazing lecture. But you probably won't. You'll just go to sleep. So that's the meme competition. Uh, and we are the meme machines who are doing the copying, varying, and selecting. So this causes us to have to ask the question, um, uh, which memes succeed and which don't. And you can see here who has the best ones, of course. How are we going to decide that? In general, I would say that some memes win because they are in some sense of value to us. Good, true, beautiful, useful, whatever, in some sense valuable to us. Others succeed despite not being. And I've just thrown a few examples here like uh, junk food, psychic powers, which as you've heard, and thank you again for that delightful introduction, I did spend quite a few years as a parapsychologist looking for paranormal phenomena and not finding them. Even yesterday, after a lecture, a similar lecture to this, uh, a feng shui master came up to me and said, I'm helping people with feng shui. It's 4,000 years old. I can, you know, I'm going, oh, shut up. Uh, because uh, if you spend a long time looking for paranormal phenomena and not finding them, it gets a bit irksome. But anyway, that, enough of that. Um, and then there's, of course, um, the way that religions as meme plexes... In fact, Richard Dawkins um, calls religions viruses of the mind. And it's a very interesting term because, in some senses, they're rather good for the genes. Uh, religious people have more children than non-religious people. In fact, atheists in the world today are reproducing below um, replacement level. And um, Hasidic Jews are going eight per woman. And... Um, Catholics, three or four per woman. Uh, anyway, never mind about that. But from our point of view, from the point of, um, of human flourishing and wars and things. Anyway, that's another whole thing. But the point about the, the religious meme plexes, co-adapted complex of memes, um, is that they protect themselves with promises of hell, threats of heaven, admonitions to pass on the ideas and believe in them. Even in some religions, uh, you die if you're an apostate and that sort of thing. Um, so these memes are very clever. The way to think about the evolution of religion is not that somebody invented it, um, but that of all, you can see branches, evolutionary branches of religious groups, um, that the ones that just fit the zeitgeist at the time get uh, more, more people to adopt them and pass them on, and it's just the same selective process operating here. So how did all this come about? Well, I know this looks like a silly, silly picture, 
but it's a very scientific picture. Because when I wrote my first article about memes in Scientific American made this picture for me. So um, <laughs> uh, here's the chap who's invented for how to light a fire. And here's all these ones who are all learning it from him. They're copying him because they can now imitate, you see. Uh, and here's a poor guy who can't imitate and he's getting cold and going to die. And these guys can imitate, but instead of um, uh, lighting fires, they're putting you know, feathers in their hair and so on, which of course might make them attractive to women and they might try all kinds of things. And if any of those things worked as being attractive or, or maybe they'd look more frightening and win wars better or whatever it might be, it doesn't matter, um, they would pass them on. But it makes the point that once you can imitate, then you will, there'll be a tendency to imitate anything and everything. But that wouldn't be very good for us because we might imitate jumping off cliffs or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, we have to become selective imitation devices. And this is one of the, the, this is how we think about human brains, the selective imitation machines. Um, so human meme machines. I, um, I put this little picture of Chantek. He's... Um, uh, a orangutan that I visited. I mean, the fact is, we, we, um, Meltzoff has described us as the consummate um, imi imitators, uh, unlike other creatures. I love that picture there. But many people seem to think that their dogs and cats can imitate, and, you know, and they can't. There is quite a lot of research now on imitation in other species. Of course, bird song, uh, cetaceans, um, songs under the sea, and so on. Um, but uh, action imitation is much rarer. Uh, some birds can do it. And other apes to a very limited extent. I made a TV program, um, I was presenter of it, I mean, um, and this is Chantek in Atlantic, Atlanta Zoo. And uh, he, I was told that he could play Simon Says. And what this meant, I had to learn a little bit of sign language, and what, what this meant is um, I would have to do the sign for, for Simon Says and uh, do some action, and he would stare at me like... And then very, very slowly, with huge effort, he would do it. Now, do you remember the game Simon Says? Is it possible to have a bit more light in the audience for a moment? If there's anybody out, out there? <laughs> Is there anybody there? Oh, no, obviously not. So uh, I will have to stare into the audience. Okay, we're going to play Simon Says. You do have this game in, in, in this country, don't you? If you don't remember Simon Says or, or, or you never played it as a kid, this is the rules, all right? Hey, thank you very much. And you can turn them off again when we finish playing Simon Says. Right. Simon Says is this. I'm Simon, okay? And if I say Simon Says jump up and down, then you jump up and down. If I just say jump up and down without saying Simon Says, then you don't jump up and down. Okay? Are you ready? Very easy rules. Got it? Okay. Simon Says... Tap your head. Simon says, snub your nose. Simon says, pull your ear. Mm, arms in the air. Na, 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 na. <laughs> lots of you, got lots of you. Excellent, excellent. Okay, you can put them all back into their dimness. Um, <laughs> brilliant. Now, the point of this was only just to have some fun. There's no point at all. Um, no, not really. The point of this is for us adult humans, uh, imitation, we, we can suppress imitation. Little kids can't, which is why at a kid's birthday party, the four and five-year-olds will, will get tricked by it and the six and seven-year-olds will go, na 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 na. Um, and this depends on the, the development of the frontal lobes and the whole... Um, uh, inhibition systems that, that help us control behavior and so on. How different that is from Chantek, who had to struggle 26 years he'd been trained to, to do this by the time that I had my sign language conversation with him. Whereas little kids imitate very early, they love imitation, they enjoy being imitated. I have suggested, but it, not many people agree with me, that what makes us human is our capacity for imitation. That, in my opinion, is a starting point for humanity, absolutely, because that's what lets loose memes, and that's what happened when we began to imitate. We allowed a second layer of evolutionary process on top of the first, a second replicator building on the machinery created by the first replicator. You're wrong, pressing the wrong thing. 
Now, we can take some general principles from biology about what makes a successful replicator. And those principles are fidelity, in other words, the accuracy of copying, fecundity, the number of copies made, and longevity, how long each copy lasts. Now, it's very interesting to think about the progression of these things, because if we started up here with this lot, well, it's very hard to have high fidelity copying of how to make a fire stay alight, um, you know, <laughs> fiddling with twigs and whatever. Dance is very difficult. Um, you, somebody said jokingly, well, you might want to do a dance here. Yes, imagine I'm going to dance. Hmm? Now, anyone who can copy that accurately is pretty amazing. And you would get deterioration down the chain. If I did that and you copied it, and then I went away and somebody watched you, it would deteriorate. Um, you need to digitize things and you need to have ways of preventing that happening. I'm coming back to that later. So fidelity of copying is one thing. Um, but um, that would be low, but of course we, you know, we increase it in all sorts of ways. Writing is one of those which increases all three. Imagine before there was any writing, uh, there were oral traditions which took huge effort to pass on. Once something's written down, it will last longer. That clay tablet is probably thousands of years old. Um, there was probably only one exactly like that. So, you know, these things are increased in different ways. But writing had a big impact on mimetic survival. Printing even more so, although you could say it increases fidelity and fecundity, but I'm not really sure about longevity. Newspapers um, tend to be in the dustbin uh, 24 hours later. Uh, it depends. But, of course, the number of copies is increased phenomenally once you get a printing press. And then often forgotten is transport, because you have to take the newspapers somewhere else until you have got the internet and stuff. You've got to take ideas physically from place to place. And that has speeded up enormously um, in recent centuries, from people having to walk everywhere or use other animals to planes and so on. And I think that um, the fact that most of the world's population is moving into cities now is only possible because of the transport of memes. And there are more memes. Everybody is going to be susceptible to some memes or another. Um, and they're going to be more likely to find them in a city than staying at home on the farm. Um, and the transport is important in that. So all of these things are in increasing um, the, 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 the meme sphere. And then, of course, we get to all this wonderful machinery that we have constructed, which is... Um, processing digital information in silicon-based machinery and passing it around. The fidelity is phenomenally high. If you send an email and an and a attached picture to somebody, you do not expect it to arrive with mistakes in the text or blurry bits in the picture. I guess it can occasionally happen, but it's amazing high fidelity how it doesn't. The variation doesn't come about uh, typically in this system, by errors or equivalence of mutation. It comes about by people varying things, or I will come to um, uh, software doing it itself. So, uh, but I don't know about longevity. <laughs> Are we going to kill ourselves off before it lasts very long? But let's leave that question in the air. So, for quite some time, the first time that I ever mentioned this was in my TED lecture 10 years ago. Um, and I was very uncertain about it then. And as these 10 years have gone by, I'm much, much more confident. So I'm going to tell you confidently what I think now, even if it's mad, and I should say most people think it is, but most sensible people think it is. Um, so my concern was, is all this stuff just more memes? Or is there something fundamentally different going on? In other words, is there a third replicator on planet Earth? So Dawkins said, you know, we've got genes and then memes, and I'm asking whether there's a third replicator or not. And what would it take to have a third replicator? I thought about this endlessly. What would be the conditions under which I would say definitely there is a third replicator? Well, by definition, it's got to be information that is copied and varied and selected. So I just made my, out of my head a rule to myself that if there was 
uh, digital information processed in silica machinery that is copying, varying, and selecting information out of human control, then that would mean there's a new replicator. And back in 2008, I was not sure that that was the case. I thought it probably was, but I wasn't sure. Now, it's obvious. Obvious is copying and storage. You know, that's what these machines do. What about the variation? Well, how many are here of students here? Lots of you. Okay, how many of you have bought an essay <laughs> online? <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, your teachers are looking. Don't put your hand up. Um, but you will know, I'm sure, that you can go online and buy an essay and you pay more. The, the, greater, the better the mark you want, the more you pay. And these are produced by... Um, uh, artificial neural networks, um, the, the more expensive ones produced by very complex multi-layered artificial neural networks, deep learning in other words. And the point about artificial neural networks is that although they operate on straightforward machinery with algorithms written by humans, maybe the backprop algorithm or some other version, they consist of these layers of cells. And they learn. And they learn by getting feedback. So you put in loads of stuff, and then you correct the answer coming out. To take something very simple, in the early days they did things like train a network to recognize male faces versus female faces. And they put in loads and loads of photos and then told them the answers, whether they got them right or wrong. And the network learns by adjusting the weights, which is sort of analogous to how brains learn by adjusting the uh, strength of connections in synapses between neurons. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that the person who's set this thing up can look at the network and not really know what it's done to, to be able to produce the right output. So we can't see how it's done it, we can see what it's done. So as far as the essays are concerned, um, it doesn't have to be a person putting them in. You see, some other program can do it. Now, that's not a difficult thing. Um, uh, once things set up and going, so loads and loads of essays are put in, given marks, the, the, the uh, network learns what marks they are, and then you pay your money and you get one that's uh, going to get a really good mark. There's lots of other examples of variation. I mean, even something as simple as a Google search. Um, you put in your search. Now, you're needed. I'm not saying humans are not needed, but keep thinking in your mind what our role is. Um, so you put in a Google search, and what happens? It selects without any human intervention. It goes around and in you know, 0.56 seconds, it, it studies 100,000 um, documents, and it comes up with a list of whatever, the, however many it has on the first page. And it will be different for you than for me, um, for all sorts of dubious and worrying reasons. Um, but there's no question that it's varying. And is it selecting? Yes, of course it's selecting. Um, it's selecting um, in, in the Google search. Um, but also, what about those adverts you're getting all the time? Who's selected them? Oh, algorithms have selected them. In the beginning, uh, there would have been people sitting in those big mega corporations thinking, ha-ha, if we buy this data from Amazon, one that everyone's bought, and we sell this to, you know. But now it's all, you know, most of it is done by... Uh, somebody letting loose some kind of software, some kind of algorithm to do this job and your data being sold all over the place and passed around. So I think that it is incontrovertible that there is information copied with variation and selection by machinery out there that we thought we made for ourselves and it's actually doing it for itself. If this is a... I mean, I think it's inc incontrovertible that happens... Whether it's useful to think about it as a third level of, of evolution is my point this evening, and I think it is, and I think we need a, a name for the new replicator. And I propose the name Treams. It's not a great name. Trouble is, I said Teams to begin with in the TED lecture, and then people started spelling it T-E-A-M-S and saying, oh, which team do you support? And oh, for God's sake. Um, excuse me. <coughs> it's not as bad as the paranormal. <coughs> So I changed it to dreams to kind of go with try. I also wrote an article in New Scientist and said, please give me a name. I thought, that's the way to do it. Get loads of people. So loads of people wrote in. I got 23 proposals, chimemes and cheems and techiemes and, you know, all kinds of things. And there were no more than two or three people chose any one of these 23. And I just, oh, for goodness sake, there's no obvious answer here. Um, and this will just have to thrive or not as an idea. Um, so I'm proposing that... There is a third replicator on planet Earth. There are genes, 
memes and dreams. Now, I want to explore with you lot, because you're quite a clever lot. How long have I got? Oh, fine, fine, fine. Um, way back in the meme machine, I proposed that we think about certain things going on in biology in terms of the idea that there are two ways of copying things. Well, there are lots more, but at least two ways. One is you copy the thing itself, and the other is that you copy the instructions for making that thing. So in the case of the dance, you know, you're copying the, the dance itself, it, you're going to get a deteriorating chain. Richard, has written, Richard Dawkins has written about this as well. You're going to get a deteriorating chain. But if you copy the instructions for making something, you can keep the instructions safe. And then when you produce the thing, it doesn't matter what happens to the thing because you've still got the instructions for making a new one. So uh, a recipe for a wonderful chocolate cake would be like this. If somebody follows a recipe and they forget to put whatever it is in it, or they put margarine instead of butter and it doesn't taste so nice, or whatever, it really doesn't matter because they can still um, email somebody else the, the, the recipe and they'll do it better. Or if the cake gets, you know, dropped on the floor or something, it doesn't matter. Now we can think of the way this has happened on... Um, the history of life on this planet, we begin what's called naked replicators. In other words, stuff that's just copied, stuff, copied, stuff, copied. Um, it is thought that in the primeval soup there was a simple copying of crystal forms and so on. We're not really sure, but that kind of thing. But, as you probably well know, in um, most of biology, we get a separation of the phenotype from the genotype. So your genes passed down through the eggs and sperms are protected and this is the germline, and this is why Lamarckian inheritance is supposed to be impossible, as in the inheritance of acquired characteristics, because this fly, um, the instructions for making the fly, are kept separate in the germline, and it doesn't matter what happens to each individual fly, um, as long as it passes on its genes. So then I'm proposing, and what I'm trying to think about in my own mind is, is, is whether this three-level thing makes sense and how it could have come about. So then I'm saying, well, from the same process, we got human beings, gradually, but eventually. And then what happened? One of these creatures, all this biology all over the planet, just this particular one, began to imitate. And to begin with, the imitation was pretty crude, so it's, again, a naked replicator, copying the things itself, copying the behaviours, copying the sounds, and they might have become words, becoming digitised, because digitised words can be passed on more accurately than vague grunts or whatever. Um, but they're basically naked memes. Now, one of the major objections to memetics that comes up again and again is, oh, but memetics will be Lamarckian, and Lamarckian inheritance doesn't work, so therefore memetics is a load of rubbish. Well, this is, this is my counter to that it wouldn't be rubbish anyway, but it would apply to naked memes that it's not a very um, effective form of evolution. But look at the modern world. All of these things, um, let us take this glass. Now, this glass was not made by somebody getting a glass blowing machine and looking at another glass, oh, looking at that one, and going, I'm going to make one exactly the same, blow the glass, mm. It was presumably made in a factory where the instructions consisted of, you know, the machinery for producing the glasses. And that would be the same for these chairs. Now, why are these seats here? They are here. They are the winners in a memetic competition. To, you know, somebody in this university thought, that's the chair I want. And loads more of them are made in the factory. And there are probably all over the university lots of chairs like this. Um, but it doesn't matter if you spill coffee on that chair or kick it to pieces. That doesn't affect the instructions back in the factory. And then what? If the same thing happened again as happened before, then what we expect is that eventually what will happen is a machine that is capable of copying another new kind of information. And that is what I propose has happened with dreams. That we humans, thinking we were doing it for ourselves, have constructed a new kind of machine which is capable of, of copying with variation and selection a new kind of information that is digital information processed in silicon-based computers, phones, servers, etc. 
So that's two examples of the same process happening of letting loose a new replicator. Well, if there is such a new replicator, it's going to be a selfish replicator, and we should ask who's going to benefit. Anybody might benefit. We might benefit, but we might not. It's in the nature of selfish replicators that they get copied whenever they can, regardless of the consequences. So if we're going to care about the consequences, then we need to start thinking about the consequences and what this means for us. I rather worry that we're concerned about the wrong things. Some of you may have seen this in the news a few months ago, that Mark Zuckerberg decided to turn off these two uh, robots because they'd started speaking to each other in a language of their own. And what they were saying, I'm sorry, I should have looked it up because I can't remember, but it was basically gobbledygook. I mean, they would say, ah, yeah, 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 yes, no, yes, no, hello, goodbye, hello, or some, you know, completely gibberish stuff. But... There are other examples of this, um, some wonderful experiments done in Belgium called the Talking Heads, where they had two simple robot heads looking at a board with different shapes on it and colours and stuff. And one would look at one of the shapes and make a noise. And the other one then followed its gaze, looked at the thing and tried to imitate the noise. And then this one would look at something and make a noise and this one looked at the same thing and tried to imitate the noise. And after many, many iterations, what happens? They both make the same noise looking at the same thing. And the humans watching wouldn't know how it came about. I mean, not in detail, just that they learned from each other. So this is clearly a possibility. But why I say I think we're worrying about the wrong thing is because if you think of artificial intelligence as being something trapped inside a robot, um, I don't think this is very helpful because you then start worrying about, you know, Terminators and robots with guns, <laughs> kill them all, you know. Uh, and I think this is, is the wrong way of thinking about it. I think this is partly because we think about ourselves and our intelligence in the wrong way. I would like you for a moment, please, to just shut your eyes and be conscious. Think about yourself, where you are, and your intelligence. Okay, I suggest that at least to some extent, you're probably imagining yourself as... Um, the audience in the Cartesian theatre, if you've been listening to, to Dennett, as somebody, a conscious entity, a, a being of some kind with consciousness and free will, sitting inside your head and being very intelligent and capable of thinking and having ideas and so on and so on. We kind of tend to do that. It's probably a simplistic and efficient way to think about ourselves to get by in the world, even if it's illusory. But if we start to think about... Um, uh, artificial intelligence that way, then we are tempted to imagine that it's embodied inside a robot or that it would be that sort of um, artificial intelligence we should worry about. But think about how our intelligence came about. Our intelligence is not one thing, the pinnacle of all kinds of intelligence. It's actually a mishmash of things we can do think, talk, eat, walk, have ideas, put theories together, um, mend the washing machine when it goes wrong. I don't know. There are all sorts of different kinds of, of intelligence and they depend on different networks operating in a complex brain. How did it come about? It came about gradually by biological <laughs> evolution and mimetic evolution, both of which have sculpted our brains. Biology to construct them in the first place, memes when we acquired language and began speaking as kids and so on later on, and all our memes we collected along the way that changed the way our brains function. Um, and really, I'm saying, what I'm saying is that exactly, that this, is, this is the kind of illusion that we have. This is um, me sitting in my Cartesian theatre uh, in control of things, I mean, I know that you know there isn't a, a comfy chair inside your head, but I submit that it can feel a bit like this. I'm in there looking out. But if we think about global intelligence, I think it's evolving in exactly the same way, but on a massively different scale. All over the planet, we are endlessly providing more and more machines um, which handle all this information. 
we are extraordinarily keen on putting out information up there. Let's see the size of pictures that people send to each other. They get bigger and bigger. Phones take big, ridiculously overkill size pictures. And then we go and email them to each other. And then videos and films and all the stuff we want to download. Oh, increase the download speed and so on. Um, I live far out in the country in rural Devon and my internet speed is so slow that those programs to test how fast it is, it won't even register, I can't measure it. It's very nice being here in a hotel where you get proper internet. Anyway, that's beside the point. The, my point is, when we think about ourselves as being uh, complex machines with distributed intelligence, it's much easier to imagine what I think is happening out there, distributed intelligence forming itself. All of this stuff is going on out there whether we like it or not. And more and more and more is it going on out there whether we like it or not. Now, I've read a lot of books recently about AI and been to lectures and whatever, and quite a lot of people saying things like, uh, oh, we, we must ensure that artificial intelligence has the right motives, that it cares about us, that it has the right morality, and therefore we need to think about things like driverless cars. You know, this is a classic um, trolley problem. Should the car, uh, there's an obstacle coming and the, and, and the one passenger's going to die, uh, should it let that happen rather than crash into the little, oh, look, 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 there's a little, put, little kid in a pushchair. Oh, dear, that, does that ca carry more weight than an old lady like me who doesn't matter because you're going to die soon anyway? And all of these kind of things. Well, uh, could you just come here a moment, Simon? Uh, here's my robot, right? <laughs> now, imagine, uh, it's a great robot. You stand still, very good. You're not very good moving robot. But, you know, I stick this intelligence in. I tell him what to do. I put him, he, he's the machine in the driverless car. I can kill him. Sorry, excuse me. I think I better let you sit down again. I can, I can, you know, I can finish him off. I can control that. I can turn the robot off. I can disconnect it from the internet. I, as a human being, have some control. But I don't have any control of the uh, artificial intelligence that I'm suggesting is evolving for its own sake out there. This is what is concerning me. Are we designing the AI or is it designing itself? It's designing itself. Um, think of those essays being written. I mean, it's a simplistic thing, but all of those massive um, Googles and Facebooks and things going on out there, um, there are it, it, so much software, so many algorithms operating on data, so many um, uh, servers being built all the time. What is our role going to be in such a world? Um, I have one analogy to make, which is that this is a really horrible one, okay? This, this is an analogy with mitochondria, because we know, or most people believe, that mitochondria, which are the power-producing um, organelles in every cell of your body, and other animals too, were originally free-living bacteria that got engulfed by another bigger bacterium. And it was, a, it was a good deal both ways because the little mitochondrion could give up, you know, protecting itself and the big cell could give up energy production. So they both kind of benefited. That's why it's called endosymbiosis. And I'm wondering about the fact that what we're really doing is providing ever more storage space and ever more processing capacity for this evolving artificial intelligence because we are greedy for the it ourselves. But if it's using up more and more, then there's going to be a, a classic evolutionary arms race between us wanting more space for our videos and films and pictures and whatever else we want, and all that stuff out there wanting more space to put in. It's all the things it's invented and all the stuff it's selling backwards and forwards and all this kind of stuff. So we're going to have to produce more energy. Now, I read the other day someone's prediction that by 2020, we will... Um, uh, 5% of the output of electricity of the planet will be used for server, running the servers. It's about 3% at the moment and increasing fast. I'm concerned that what will happen is that we don't know what the information is. I kind of call it dark information, but I don't know whether that's a good idea. But the idea that there's all this stuff constantly filling up the space and we want space for ourselves and we'll go on digging up the oil, digging up the gas, um, putting up more solar farms just to, to power this uh, increasing uh, process out there. So we just become absorbed into the giant tree, ma tree machine to supply its energy. Well, that's a depressing way. Perhaps I should have put a more cheerful one, but I suppose my end point is to say, 
if this is the right way of thinking about it, which it may not be at all. The convent more conventional ways of thinking about it might be far better. But if this is a useful way of thinking about it, then the best thing we can do is to understand it and we need to get on with it quickly because it's happening very fast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is the first time I witnessed someone playing uh, Simon Says with a room full of adults <laughs> and actually doing the na 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 na. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. Congratulations, help it. It's, it's, it's really beautiful. I was so pleased that lots of you were fell yes. for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was wonderful. Um, would you like to sit down or stand up? What is your preference? I'm fine standing up, actually. Um, I can see everybody better. I think I'd feel a bit silly down here. How about you? If you'd like to sit down, please well, do. I, I like standing. Let's sit down for a minute and then we'll see how we go. How about that? Oh, of course. <laughs> Only you didn't do this and you should have. You let me go on. No, you, the timing what? was perfect. Was it? Oh, yeah, we were totally happy. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe not so much with sort of the ending. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, 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 I do some work in, in AI and we have lots of worries about Terminators and... Uh, yeah. Killer robots, yep. sex robots, yep. um, and now we have another worry uh, <laughs> on our uh, plate. Um, so, um, the use of dreams, as you formulated, is actually that it makes us aware of a new threat. That basically we're gonna. I'm trying to summarize and see if I do right. Uh, that's gonna uh, take our resources away from us to produce for us maybe less relevant kind of replicators. Is that sort of the core? Yes, yes. I'm not suggesting that we need to, you know, that this is absolutely terrifying and the end of the world is nigh, um, but that, that if you think of it that way, we should be worrying about different things and we should be thinking, okay, how can we uh, better observe what's going on? How can we better make sure we know where the resources are being used up and try to think of ways to use those resources, I mean storage and processing capacity, for the purposes that suit us rather than allowing them to be nut by other things. Yes, and, and, and so continuing that line for a moment, so what would be a way to defend ourselves? I don't know. Ah. I, 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 the trouble is, you That's know, I, I sit at home and I have these ideas and I think about it and I write stuff and then I come out and talk. And I've, this is my sixth presentation in the last three days in, um, in uh, the Netherlands. And every time some bright student's gone, yes, well, what, the, what can the government do? And I'm going, no, I don't know. Well, what can any of us do? Um, and, and I don't know. And I'm just hoping that I can throw out some ideas and, and, and provoke other people into thinking what we can do. I think just knowing what, trying to understand what's happening. I mean, maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe these algorithms out there where, you know, um, uh, one great... Um, uh, international company is buying data off somebody else. Maybe we can uh, change laws so that these things can't happen. But if there are algorithms out, algorithms out there that's taking the data elsewhere and doing something else with it, that's what we ought to be worrying about. And therefore, if we knew what was happening to all that data, we might better be able to um, encourage it to serve us. The trouble is then you get into all sorts of political and difficult arguments about how much <laughs> control normal human beings can have over uh, great organisms like Facebook and Amazon and yeah. um, Google and so on. Because if I understand you correctly, we are sort of the origin of the problem in the sense that we create all these, uh, this information digitally yep. that then starts replicating itself uh, yep. also with the variation and the, the whole story. So would more self-control be a way of uh, addressing this problem? Not, not put every yes. picture you get yes. out on Facebook? Yes, yes. I mean, we could legislate potentially i can't really see uh -huh. us realistically but potentially to restrict instead of you know a free-for-all you can have as much um, bandwidth as you like you can send as much information and you can store as much information as you like have restrictions on it and stuff get thrown away because an awful lot of stuff just stays forever 
Now, in some ways, that's fantastic that we have a total, complete record of almost everything that was ever uploaded. But it could be, we could be destroyed to, to free up space. I, 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 I suddenly get an association with um, flushing a toilet. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes. My apologies. Um, uh, would a sort of regular cleaning of the internet, we now have the right to be forgotten, for instance? Yes, that's uh, an interesting in GDPR, thought. Would that, would that be sort of um, uh, be part of a solution? Flushing yes, it? Yes, yes, good point. Uh, and that reminds me about when you um, defrag your disk on your computer. I mean, mm. maybe you all have such fancy computers, but I, until very recently, had one that I really did have to defrag the disk you know, fairly regularly because it was all filling up and I needed to make more space for more stuff. And then, of course, I bought a new one with much more space. So, you know, this is, this is what I'm talking about. Um, but, yeah, that's a good idea.